Hello everyone, this is the seventh video in our series of tutorial videos regarding the EM solver and the currents. In this video, we'll talk about the special feature of the EM solver, namely what happens when two conductor parts come into contact and current is supposed to flow between them. So far, uh, we have mainly focused on electromagnetic metal forming as the main application of the EM solver and the currents. But uh, for this video, um, as the sticker here clearly indicates, uh, we're going to use a slightly different application for illustration purposes, namely the railgun. So, if you're unfamiliar with the EM solver and the currents, uh, I strongly recommend that you check some of the previous parts, unless of course you just want to hear a bit more about railguns. In any case, without further ado, let us begin. First of all, what is a railgun? Well, a railgun is primarily an electric gun which uses eddy currents and the Lorentz force in order to accelerate and launch projectiles at several times the speed of sound. They were conceptualized in the early 20th century and there were some timid studies uh, for military purposes done at the end of World War II and uh, in the years immediately following it. Um, but for the main part, the huge capacity, the huge energy uh, that you needed to generate enough Lorentz forces to uh, propel the projectile uh, meant that it was mostly seen in science fiction or, or in video games uh, from the 90s. However, uh, nowadays you periodically hear some uh, news about the US Navy conducting research and doing live tests on railgun. The idea uh, is to use railguns as a defense mechanism against incoming missiles uh, and, and other you know, threats. The main appeal of a railgun, besides uh, you know, its supersonic projectile, is that it uses no powder. Uh, it's a pure electric gun. Uh, and this is, you know, always good when you are aboard a ship. Uh, you are usually um, more afraid of an enemy missile hitting your munition stor storage room um, than the missile actually sinking you. And this is what you see below on the picture. Uh, it's a snapshot of a YouTube video uh, showing a live railgun test and um, with a high-speed high camera. Uh, the flames that you see behind they happen actually so fast that they are usually not visible to the naked human eye. Uh, and what they show, you know, there's no powder, so it's not the explosion. Uh, what it shows is that the air itself is becoming a plasma and igniting uh, due to the strong magnetic field. Yeah, it's one of the consequences and one of the problems uh, that you have to overcome when you design a railgun. So how do they work? Uh, well, take a look at the sketch uh, below there on the left. Uh, in its most basic form, a railgun consists of two parallel metal rails uh, connected to an electric power supply. And when a projectile is inserted between the two bars, it provides a conductive path between the rails and this way you complete the circuit. The current flowing through the circuit generates a powerful magnetic field be between the bars and this in, turns, in turn will create a Lorentz force uh, which is then applied on the projectile. This Lorentz force uh, is huge and the projectile will come out at supersonic speeds. Um, yeah, so in summary, you have this conductor, the projectile, which slides along the rails, uh, and then two other conductors. So uh, now back to uh, the EM solver. Uh, this will now be three parts that are in contact, and current must be allowed to flow through them. That's the big difference uh, between you know this application and the, the ones we saw in the previous videos. Um, and so this makes it the perfect uh, example application in order to explain how the EM solver handles contact uh, between conductors. So, um, for the FEM part, uh, simple extra constraints can be passed to the system. Uh, but the difficulty in handling the contact, uh, electromagnetic contact, lays in the BEM system. Indeed, uh, let me remind me, you very quickly that the EM solver uses a BEM method to calculate the interaction between conductors based on the biot savart law. Uh, so, uh, for those who don't know, this is a double integral um, that's divided by the distance. So when two faces uh, from the BM mesh come into contact, uh, you know, you get a number divided by the distance, which in this case is zero, uh, and this will lead to infinity. Okay, so uh, the problem will diverge. Unless you turn on the electromagnetic contact detection uh, feature, and in which case, uh, what will happen is the following. Uh, in the first step, the EM solver will loop over all the BM faces and find out which ones are in contact. Then it will remove those faces from the BM mesh. Okay, a little bit like the EM boundary keyword um, that we saw in a previous video, except this is done automatically and internally by the EM solver. And then finally, as a last step, it will stitch the BM meshes together, creating a skirt mesh 
um, and which will result in one continuous closed BEM mesh. Uh, this is what you see below. The third image shows the internal BEM mesh, which the solver builds in order to solve the system. Okay, so again, uh, two faces uh, that are in contact will get will get removed from the BEM uh, system, and then instead, uh, the solver will automatically and internally, the user does not see this, uh, will stitch the faces back together and resulting in just one continuous BEM mesh, um, and then the solver will be able to solve that. And then one important point um, is that this contact search and the stitching, uh, this you know removing the BM faces and building the skirt mesh, it happens only um, whenever the BM system is recomputed. Okay, again, uh, see uh, the the previous videos. Um, so you might need to recompute the BM system rather often uh, in those cases where there is contact between con conductors in order to ensure stability, which in turn you know, um, might have an important impact on your calculation times. Okay, let me remind you that recomputing the BM system is the costliest part of the EM solve. Uh, and so for when there's contact, you need to pay attention to that because your, your calculation times uh, can quickly rise. So, um, you know, use it, the, turn this uh, EM contact on only when uh, it's necessary. And then here quickly below, there's two videos, uh, one which shows what is displayed in the results, uh, the projectile which is sliding along the rails due to EM current, uh, which is flowing through the rails and through the projectile. This is what the user sees. Uh, and the other one uh, which shows what happens internally to the BM mesh, how the skirt uh, evolves and, and is being uh, rebuilt as the projectile slides along the rails. So, um, before we mention the keywords that are needed to trigger the EM contact, a uh, quick word on the conditions for contact uh, that are used by the EM solver. Basically, there are three things the EM solver is looking at, uh, each with its own tolerance values, uh, which the user can change. So, the first one is that uh, for, you know, uh, for two phases uh, that are from the BM mesh, which are divided into triangles, um, the, the solver checks if the normals are sufficiently aligned, okay? uh, if the corners of one element fall into the other element, and finally, if they are close enough, there's a distance criteria, uh, which by default is based on the element size, but which the user can, again, change to a fixed uh, value if he wants to. Regarding keywords, uh, the one which turns the contact on is called EM control contact. By default, the solver will loop over all the BM faces uh, in order to check whether any meet the EM contact conditions. However, it is also possible to specify local contacts between part sets in the EM contact keyword and to have the EM contact search only done on those parts in order to save some calculation time. Okay. Basically, when the user knows that contact will happen only between two parts, uh, no need to turn the search on for all the conductors. Okay. Only uh, tell the solver only look for uh, which BEM elements or BEM faces are in contact uh, on those parts. And, you know, it's also in the same uh, local contact keyword definition that you can change uh, the local conditions for contact happening. Okay, uh, mention those tolerance values or this distance criteria. Uh, well, this is where you get to change it. Okay, so you can check that in the keyword manual. And then finally, brief uh, mention of this uh, keyword. If the EM contact only happens during a specific part of the run, you know, you can turn it on and off uh, by using the keyword EM control switch contact. So this is uh, the Railgun input deck and the Railgun example, which uh, again you can find on the Dyna examples uh, website, like all the others which we have seen, um, you know, in the in the previous videos. Uh, so the first thing to uh, remark here is that, uh, as I said, you know, the BM mesh will not display the skirt because that's done internally by the solver. Okay, so here uh, you see those two meshes, BM meshes, overlapping, but internally those faces are actually removed. Okay. And then uh, if you look at uh, you know, your, your, your solid here and animate the results, you will see that uh, the projectile here is being propelled at a very high speed okay, outside uh, out of the cannon. Uh, if you look at the current density, you will see that uh, current is allowed to flow through one rail, then through the projectile and then back out the other, okay, in the other direction. And then if you look at the Lorentz force, uh, you will see that it uh, um, that it's being concentrated behind the projectile okay, and that it expels it uh, at a very high speed. If I display the vectors 
Okay, see they're very strong at the center here. Okay, the Lorentz force. Um, two things that uh, we can take a look at when we look at the input deck. Uh, so where is it here? Well, I got it here. Um, the only keyword uh, that we have added compared to our classic and the current problems, which we have seen so far, uh, is the keyword EM control contact. This basically means turn the electromagnetic contact on. And that's it. That will do. Um, then the other thing that I quickly want to note is here, if you look at the uh, recomputation frequency of your BM system, you see that it's being recomputed at every, uh, every three EM time steps, uh, which is pretty often. Uh, and um, the reason why is that uh, you'd be afraid that the projectile travels too much at every EM time step, that it crosses too many elements there of the rail, uh, that it ends up being unstable, uh, that it might crash or give very inaccurate results. Uh, so this is what I said uh, earlier, is that uh, depending on the case, uh, pay attention to that. You might uh, need to uh, recompute your BEM um, more often than you would need otherwise, because of the contact, in order for the contact to remain uh, stable. And then uh, another thing which I'd like to uh, quickly mention, I talked about the EM contact keyword, and I said that you could use it in order to optimize uh, your contact search. Uh, well, this is what uh, I did here. Okay, by default, we have those three parts, but uh, I did another run okay, where I divided uh, my uh, rails and my projectile into several parts. So here, for example, I created part number five and then part number six. And on the other side, I created part number seven and then part number eight. And what I will tell the solver is only look for contact between part number five and part number six. And in the similar fashion, only look for contact between part number seven and part number eight. So keyword-wise, uh, what are the differences? Well, I had to define those two keywords, okay, those EM contact, uh, those two contacts. Uh, here I associated part number five and part number six, and here I associate part number seven and part number eight. Part number five is actually, and part number six here, uh, those are sets of parts, but then elsewhere in the input deck, I said that part set number five is this, uh, contains part five. Okay, so you, do the, you define those two contacts here. And then here, the second uh, flag of the EM control contact, I set it to one. So this is basically only do the contact search on the contacts that are being defined here. And then when you look at the results, uh, this is the classic uh, imp uh, case from the website. So here, uh, and when you look at the timer, you see that, well, most of the... Um, most of the runtime or the is being taken by the BM uh, matrices, uh, but here the contact takes about 11% of the time, which isn't much in this case, uh, but it could be more in more complex configurations. Uh, so the contact detection takes 11% of the time, and by doing what I did by defining those local contacts, it doesn't change anything in the results. Uh, but the contact detection is now only 4% 4 of the time. Uh, so basically, I've saved 5% uh, uh, in calculation time just by taking a little bit more time to define my contacts properly. So uh, this is a couple of tricks there in order to optimize uh, your uh, BEM contact search. So if we sum up what we saw, uh, we used this uh, interesting application, the Railgun, uh, in order to show how the EM solver handled um, contact between conductors. In other words, uh, how it allowed current to flow through one conductor uh, to another. And we saw that the difficulty was always, uh, as always, uh, in the BM system. In order to avoid a divergence of that BM, uh, what the solver was to, is doing is that it removes the BM faces that are in contact and stitches uh, the faces back together, resulting in one continuous BM mesh. This is done every time there's a BM system recomputation. So uh, make sure that you do it often enough uh, for stability. Okay? But then, of course, it's always a compromise between uh, stability and then uh, uh, run times, uh, call, you know, the computational cost, because of course recomputing uh, the BEM is the thing that takes the most time. Uh, and then we mentioned, you know, three new keywords that relate that are related to contact. Um, the main one is EM control contact. That's the one that turns the EM contact search on, and basically that's the only one which you need. Uh, but then if you want to refine, fine tune a little bit uh, your contact search and optimize it, uh, perhaps, uh, then you would use the keyword EM contact. And then the last one, which we saw, which uh, we briefly mentioned, is the EM control switch contact, uh, which you can use in order to turn the contact search off after a certain time. Uh, once you're sure, uh, you, you know your problem very well, and you're sure that uh, there won't be any contact anymore between conductors. 
Right, so I hope uh, uh, that you enjoyed watching this video uh, and I hope to see you for the next one.